Hello, my name is Tori and I am a doctor of physical therapy who specializes in pelvic dysfunction, which means I treat things that can go wrong around the pelvis and this includes sexual dysfunction. If you haven't, be sure to check out the very first video in this series as it speaks more about what's considered normal and abnormal surrounding female libido and it outlines my intention behind creating this series, which is in short to walk you through how how I would approach treating female low libido as a patient who is also a pelvic health provider. Today we'll be discussing hormones and female low libido. This is a dense and complicated topic and it is my intention that you will walk away from this installation of the series with a good understanding of the female sex hormones and how they might affect female sex drive as well as an idea of of how to interpret the results of a hormone level test. However, in order to fully understand those topics, you do need a general understanding of hormones and how they function in the body, as well as a more specific understanding of the female sex hormones, how they function in the body, and how they naturally fluctuate throughout a woman's lifetime. This video is going to be dedicated to building the necessary background knowledge so that in the next video, we can jump right into the female sex hormones, how they might affect female libido, and how to read and interpret the results of a hormone level test. Of course, you can check the description below for timestamps if you want to skip around, as well as links to any studies or resources mentioned in today's video. So before we start unpacking the female sex hormones, I want to be sure you have a general understanding of hormones and how they function in our bodies. Science likes to compartmentalize the human body into different systems, and today we'll be investigating the female reproductive system and hormones, which are a part of the endocrine system. You might naturally be more familiar with the female reproductive system, which consists of the external vulva, which is the clitoris, vaginal lips, and vaginal opening, as well as the internal vagina, cervix, uterus, fallopian tubes, and ovaries. If you feel like you need a review of the female reproductive system, check out my video about getting pregnant on your period. I have an extensive review of the female reproductive system for you there. The endocrine system, on the other hand, is made up of a collection of organs known as endocrine glands that regulate different bodily functions like appetite, metabolism, heart rate, blood pressure, sleep, growth, body temperature and sexual function by releasing hormones into the bloodstream. Let's break that down a little bit more. First of all, know that an organ is considered a gland when it creates and releases a substance into the body that performs a specific action. A gland you might be more familiar with is a sweat gland. A sweat gland creates sweat, releases it onto your skin, and that cools your body down. In the case of the endocrine system, the endocrine glands create hormones, release those hormones into your bloodstream, and the hormones travel to different parts of your body and tell those parts of your body to perform different actions. These endocrine glands are located in your brain, your neck, your torso, your abdomen, and your pelvis. Second of all, it helps to think of hormones as chemical messengers and the bloodstream as those chemical messengers means of travel. An example you may be very familiar with is an adrenaline rush. Think about the last time you watched a scary movie or performed a scary activity like bungee jumping or zip lining. You might remember sweating and feeling your heart rate increase and starting to breathe really quickly and maybe getting a boost of energy. That is because your brain signaled to the endocrine glands that live in your abdomen, known as your adrenal glands, they live on top of your kidneys, to produce a hormone, adrenaline, and release that hormone in into your bloodstream so that it can travel to different parts of your body and tell those parts of your body what to do. In this example, adrenaline travels to your skin to tell your skin to start sweating. It travels to your heart to tell the cells to beat faster. It travels to your lungs to tell them that you need more oxygen flowing in your body. And it travels to your liver to tell the liver cells to break down sugar because you need more energy. So in summary, the endocrine system is 
made up of a collection of organs known as endocrine glands that produce hormones or chemical messengers and release those hormones into the bloodstream so that they can travel to different parts of your body and tell those different parts of your body what to do in order to regulate different bodily functions, including sexual function. That's why when you go to get your hormone levels tested, you'll be getting a blood test. Now that we've had a general overview of hormones and the endocrine system, let's zoom in to the sex hormones and the endocrine glands responsible for female sexual function. The female sex hormones include estrogen, progesterone, and small amounts of testosterone. The organs or endocrine glands that produce and release these sex hormones are the ovaries and the adrenal glands. Recall that the ovaries are also a part of the female reproductive system and they attach to the uterus via the fallopian tubes. The adrenal glands are the endocrine glands that we were talking about in our adrenaline rush example. Remember that they are located in your abdomen and live on top of your kidneys. Both the ovaries and the adrenal glands produce and release all three types of female sex hormones, estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone. Estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone all affect female libido, but they also play important roles in other bodily functions, such as puberty, reproduction, body fat distribution, hair growth, bone and muscle growth, cholesterol regulation, and inflammation. That means the sex hormones naturally fluctuate in our bodies throughout our lifetime. In order to understand how how the female sex hormones might affect female sex drive and to be able to interpret the results of a hormone level test you need to be aware of these natural fluctuations so some factors that might affect the levels of the female sex hormones present in someone's body include puberty menstruation pregnancy breastfeeding perimenopause and menopause which means age is a really important factor. Know that stress and medications can also affect hormones. We're going to focus on the fluctuations associated with age in this video, but if you want to learn more about stress, I will be creating a video in this series dedicated to lifestyle and how that might affect female low libido. And if you want to learn more about medications and how they might affect female libido, that video already exists in the series and you can click here to check it out. Let's examine each of these factors briefly. During puberty, all of the sex hormones naturally increase, especially estrogen. This is what stimulates breast development, armpit and pubic hair growth, an increase in body fat, the maturation of the reproductive system, and the start of menstruation or your period. So we would expect a young girl who is experiencing puberty to demonstrate high levels of all of her sex hormones, especially estrogen. During your menstrual cycle, all of the sex hormones naturally rise and fall in a pattern. There is great variation in every person's cycle. However, strictly for simplicity's sake, let's look at a four week or 28 day cycle where someone is ovulating on day 14. Recall that the very first day of your cycle is the day that you start bleeding and that the last day of your cycle, day 28 in our example, is the day before the start of your next period. Also, recall that generally speaking, there are three main phases of your menstrual cycle. The follicular phase, the ovulatory phase, and the luteal phase. The follicular phase can be simplified to the first 14 days of our example 28-day cycle. During this phase, your uterus sheds its lining, aka you get your period, you start bleeding, and your ovaries start producing follicles, which contain eggs, hence the name the follicular phase. The ovulatory phase begins when the dominant follicle ruptures and releases its egg, aka when you begin to ovulate, which again is on day 14 in our 28-day example. This phase might last half a day or a day and a half, depending on the person. Finally, the luteal phase begins after ovulation. The ruptured 
follicle closes and the uterus thickens in preparation for a fertilized egg. If a fertilized egg does not implant in the uterus, the uterus sheds its lining, the woman gets her period, and the follicular phase begins again. Now, let's look at the sex hormones and how they fluctuate during a person's cycle. Estrogen will peak twice during your cycle, once leading up to ovulation, and then again in preparation for your uterus to receive a fertilized egg. If that doesn't happen, estrogen will steadily decline again. Progesterone really peaks once during your cycle, and that's in tandem with estrogen's second peak as your uterus prepares to receive a fertilized egg. If that doesn't happen, progesterone will also steadily decline again. Finally, testosterone slowly but steadily rises during your follicular phase, peaks in tandem with estrogen's first peak during your ovulatory phase, and then slowly but steadily declines again during the luteal phase. So we would expect a woman of reproductive age who is not pregnant to have different levels of all three sex hormones circulating in her system depending on where she is in her menstrual cycle. This could be one way for us to study how the different sex hormones might affect female libido. And this must be taken into consideration when interpreting the results of a hormone level test. Of course, if you are using any type of hormonal birth control, these fluctuations are going to be different. I don't have time in this video to invest every example of the different types of hormonal birth control, but I do encourage you to be aware that this is the case, to research the specific kind of birth control that you are taking, and to learn how it might affect your hormone levels so that you can better interpret the results of a hormone test. During pregnancy, both estrogen and progesterone steadily rise as the fetus develops. We would expect a woman in her third trimester to have higher levels of estrogen and progesterone than a woman in her second trimester, and a woman in her second trimester to have higher levels of these hormones than a woman in her first. We would also expect any pregnant woman in any trimester to have higher levels of estrogen and progesterone than a woman who is not pregnant. Finally, we've also found that testosterone seems to also steadily increase during pregnancy. We'd also expect a pregnant woman to have higher levels of testosterone than a non-pregnant pregnant woman. After delivery, estrogen levels drop and stay low until a woman is done breastfeeding. Progesterone levels also drop and they will stay low until a woman ovulates again. Finally, testosterone levels are also lower in a woman who is breastfeeding. So we would expect a postpartum breastfeeding woman who has not yet gotten her period back to have low levels of all three sex hormones. During perimenopause and menopause, both estrogen and progesterone levels decline. Now, perimenopause menopause is considered the period of time leading up to menopause, and menopause is officially declared menopause when someone has not had a period for 12 months in a row. So during perimenopause, while progesterone steadily declines, estrogen levels tend to go all over the place. They sort of oscillate up and down, and it's the steady decline in progesterone and this almost unpredictable behavior, up and down behavior of estrogen that leads to the irregular periods, mood changes, hot flashes, difficulty sleeping, and vaginal dryness that a lot of women experience during that perimenopausal time. After a person reaches menopause, her ovaries do still constantly produce and release progesterone and estrogen, just very small amounts of those hormones. Now, the decline in testosterone in women, on the other hand, is solely age-related and has nothing to do with menopause and actually begins years before perimenopause. Testosterone levels peak in women in their 20s and slowly decline after that. By the time most women reach menopause, their testosterone levels are half of what they were when they peaked in their 20s. This is because both your ovaries and your adrenal glands continue to create and release testosterone even after estrogen and progesterone levels decline following menopause. So we would expect a perimenopausal woman to have unpredictable fluctuating levels of estrogen, lower levels of progesterone, and testosterone levels that match her age. And we 
we'd expect a menopausal woman to have low levels of estrogen and progesterone and testosterone levels that match her age. All right, now that you have a general knowledge of hormones and how they function in our bodies, as well as a good background on the female sex hormones, what they are, how they function, and how they naturally fluctuate throughout our lifetime, we can shift our focus to the two main questions. How do estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone affect female libido and how do I interpret the results of a hormone level test. And that is exactly where we will pick up in the next video in this series. On that note, thank you so much for watching. I am approaching this series differently than other content that I've created in the past. So I am very, very open to your constructive criticism, to your feedback, to any suggestions that you have about how I can make this series better. So so if you liked this video or found it helpful, please do give it a thumbs up. And if you didn't like it, please do give it a thumbs down and feel free to tell me what I can do to improve. Leave me feedback, ask me questions, content suggestions. You know you can comment anything down below. I do try really hard to read and respond to all of my comments. Don't forget to check me out on Instagram. And finally, if you want to, please subscribe to the channel for more content, not only about pelvic things like today's video, but also about life things. Again, thank you so much for watching. I hope that you have a wonderful rest of your day and I will see you in the next video. Bye.